Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, which is still wrapped in a pandemic, among other things. It's a human heated planet. It's a planet in which uh, we have surged at development in, for decades in rich countries and poor countries, moving into zones of risk, um, of hazard from flooding and heat and like in, in most cases, we're doing that faster than the climate is changing, which creates a complicated landscape for uh, the media and the public to and, and policymakers to uh, engage and understand uh, what do you do? You know, if, is this global warming? Is this bad development? Is this, um, simply nature's wonders that the you know extremes happen rarely. That's the nature of the word extreme. Uh, and today we're going to explore this in the context of the media, primarily, but uh, hopefully with the scientists coming on too. Uh, I'm Andy Revkin at the Columbia Climate School, uh, reporting to you from uh, rural Maine, from uh, Penobscot Territory, uh, on a coastal situation that is similar to the one that Corey Dean is in, in um, Massachusetts, out on the islands uh, near Cape Cod, Cornelia Dean. With me, she was my science, the science editor at the New York Times for a chunk of my time there. Uh, she's an author of a book that you'll hear about too, on essentially on dealing with environmental change that where we're driving the change, even as we're uh, moving into harm's way. And Joydeep Gupta, who's in Delhi, and he runs uh, he, for Internews Earth Journalism Network. He runs the uh, the Third Pole, which is a fantastic collaborate collaborative journalism project. Um, in South Asia, um, the third pole being that great tower of high frozen material that supplies water and uh, influences the climate for a, a billion or two people. And of course, today we're going to talk about Pakistan and a little bit about um, uh, the Horn of Africa and extreme drought and, and heat as well. It's great to have you both here. Um, and first of all, uh, Maybe we'll start with Joy Deep. Uh, you've got journalists and yourself uh, focused on these questions right now. How has this story evolved for you? You know, you had the spring heat, extreme heat, you know, for that time of year. And now this epic monsoon, eight weeks of uh, rain, uh, I would say off the charts. Um, although in 2010, there was a devastating flood, killed 2,700 people in Pakistan as well. So what's what's the tenor of things right now? Well, it's very bad. It's very bad. Of course, it's absolutely terrible in Pakistan. It's also very bad in India. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the at the end of the day, they're adjacent countries and the rainfall and the weirdness of the heat waves and the monsoon, they go across political boundaries. Right. So let's say all of South Asia and large parts of Southeast and Central Asia are in a terrible, terrible situation, largely caused by climate change and worsened by poor development. And at the same time, you, you tell, tell us about uh, the third poll a little bit. Well, the third poll, as you pointed out, Andy, is the Hindu Kush Himalayas, the world's uh, tallest mountain range that goes all the way from west to east from Afghanistan to Burma. So it takes in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Tibet and China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh and Myanmar. And it actually provides water to almost 2.9 billion people. All of China, all of South Asia, all of Southeast Asia, mainland, and much of Central Asia. So that is an absolutely crucial place, which is being hit very hard by climate change. The average rise in temperature, the rate is about thrice uh, of the global average. And I can see that you're putting out the dissipating glaciers of the Himalayas. Yes, mm -hmm. glaciers are receding at a very, very fast pace. We are in this weird situation where uh, the Pakistan government has been saying that the, that Pakistan has the highest number of glaciers outside the poles. Uh, 
and we don't even know what the number is because mm -hmm. every year the number keeps changing because glaciers are as they're receding they're splitting so what was one oh, glacier becomes two yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. what was one glacier becomes two what was two becomes three you know, they're, they're at the end of the day they are water lines right yeah. So uh, when as they recede, they split, uh, and so uh, nobody knows the numbers. These, but it is for sure that the faster melt rate of these glaciers all over this summer has contributed quite significantly to the absolutely terrible uh, monsoon-induced floods that we have had now in first in India and then in Pakistan. Yeah, and I remember I had you on here. Uh, it was over a year ago when um, uh, the d two dams in um, the Himalayas collapsed after a giant uh, sort of rock and ice fall, uh, devastating. And it showed all these converging issues. You have the climate change destabilizing and uh, causing some of these abrupt changes in the Himalayas and the, the geology and the, and the uh, glaciology. And then you had dams being developed in an area that's fundamentally prone to earthquakes plus uh, rock slides and stuff uh, so so that it's just such a challenge to uh cover all of that and as you said it's not just india it's not just pakistan it's not just uh, bhutan it's a it's a region so how do you cover how do you sort of um how do you build that reporting uh, capacity well, you, you know what we do is we are an environment news website Right. So what we essentially do is to bring the voice is from the grassroots to the policy level. So right now, in fact, we are inundated with story pitches from Pakistan, especially the mountain areas, uh, with uh, uh, reporters telling us the crops gone from in northwest Pakistan, then northeast Pakistan, then from central mountains of Pakistan. We, uh, we are getting this, um, we, I just got a story pitch saying uh, uh, all our winter firewood is, has been completely damaged by the rain. Right. So what are we going to do with the winter coming? Boy, and that shows uh, you, that, but that's what's so interesting. You see, by having that sensory apparatus out there, reporters on the ground, you know, who in the media would have thought, oh, what about wet firewood? Yeah. It, res it resonates for me because I just got two cords of firewood here in in, uh, in Maine. Yeah, so and, all the firewood is wet. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and 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 there the food, you know, these ramifications build forward too. It's not like yeah, yeah. the floodwaters go away. Um, I'm yeah. glad to see. Uh, so again, Corey, we'll hear from Corey Dean in a minute too, and uh, uh, Manu Lau, who uh, directs the Columbia Water Center here at the Columbia University, and linked in very strongly to the climate school, is with us. Uh, he's been digging in on the hydrology, the climatology of the situation, uh, and it's great to have you here, Manu. Thanks. Uh, good to uh, join in and listen to this wonderful discussion. Well, I'm hoping you'll contribute to it as well, because uh, you, you you think about water in pretty much every dimension, uh, which is a rarity. Water quality, uh, the uh, failures of dams, uh, you're, you're a remarkable resource for me as a reporter going going forward. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to this for in a second, but I wanted to get Corey Dean uh, into the uh, conversation here too. Um, Corey Cornelia, you you were uh, you have been an editor, you were an editor for a long time um, in, in both the politics in Washington and then science through the whole span uh, when I was uh, on the science desk and uh, much of it. And so when you see uh, the news flowing like this, let's talk about how you how it used to be <laughs> and how it is you know suppose this uh, monsoon uh, flooding disaster had peaked um, back in 2003 well there was one in 2010 but that was after you were uh, off the desk i think but so w what's the news cycle feel like today compared to the way it used to be and what are the challenges we face well i think the important thing to think about is where we are now and where we're likely likely to be going forward um we would have had more resources then than we have now and uh, we are still the times is still a lavishly supported news operation but um, um 
most other news outlets are not in this country. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. I worked for years at the Providence Journal, as you know, in Rhode Island, where you grew up. And uh, I'm not saying the Projo would have had a reporter on the ground in, in uh, Pakistan or Bangladesh or India wow. for these monsoon, um, this extraordinary monsoon event. But we might have. That's the kind of thing we would have done. And that's when the Projo had a newsroom of 400 people, and now it has a newsroom of about 20. Wow. So that kind of thing is not going to happen anymore. And um, the other thing is, and I don't know when you want to introduce it, the question of the uh, uh, ice loss that was that caused quite a stir in the past week. But um, one problem that is afflicting everybody, including us at the Times, is um, the desire for traffic and the right. production, relentless production of what amounts to clickbait. And that is, I think that's very destructive. And I think it, not just because it's putting a lot of stuff out there that is possibly, you know, verging on the erroneous, but it it contributes, I think, to the public's declining trust in the media because they see they're attracted to something and then they open it up and there's less there than meets the eye. However, the fact that they have clicked on it satisfies some corporate demand for traffic. And I don't yeah. know how um, I don't know how we're going to deal with that since they, as some wise person once said to me, you know, I asked the question, what's the what's the primary organization uh, goal? What's the primary mission of the news um, organization? And I, of course, went immediately to, you know, bring the truth to the people and so on. Uh, and he said, no, the primary goal is to remain in business because mm. you, you don't need to make a profit to be profitable. That is the primary goal. And if you don't do that, wow. you're doomed. And so given the current business environment, what the answer to this is, I have no idea. But I think it's a, I think it's definitely a problem. And it, it um, tends to shift attention to uh, audiences that have more money, that have more media access, that have all of those things that are not necessarily what we should be focusing on, at least not all the time. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. And uh, actually at the end of this webcast this morning, I'm gonna show an interview I did with a glaciologist uh, who, who, an expert on Greenland, who was very disturbed by the way that coverage played out, including to a certain extent, the role of the authors of the paper who uh, presented this paper on sea level rise related to Greenland, a new finding, but didn't, really the paper didn't have a timeline and to me and to Corey, of course and to a scientist like manu um who said that interface of human geography and and environmental change that change the rate of change is a key question if you're thinking about coastal well, you know i mean the, the clickbait issue also afflicts uh people in university institutional media offices and um when, so the Second book that I wrote was a guide to researchers on communicating with the lay public. And right. one of the things I tell them in this book is that if they have some work that they think is going to be newsworthy, they need to get in touch with their institution's news office as early in the process as possible to prevent this kind of distortion, if you want to call it that, this kind of omission that weakens um, the usefulness of the report because the news offices are going to be looking for traffic also. Everybody's looking for traffic, so. Yes, it's, it's a real challenge. Uh, Manu, uh, let's get to the back to the the, the, the events that have unfolded. Uh, uh, and then I'd like to get your reaction to how the media covers some of this. I've got to show you something in a minute too. But uh, you've been through this drill before in many contexts. So what are we seeing here that's new what's your sense of the role of human driven climate change the role of landscape change and and the like yeah i think you know this particular landscape is uh makes for a rather touching story uh because we are looking at a region of the world that's one of has some of the poorest people some of the highest rural densities 
And so, you know, yesterday the Voice of America guy was asking me, what's the solution? Uh, and that's humbling because I, you know, we can talk all about what we can do with science uh, and thinking about clickbait. Yeah, I can come up with lots of clickbait uh, statements which will be propagated. But frankly, the real challenge here is that there are so many people living in essentially what under a high rainfall regime could be one of the largest deltas in the world. The reason it's not is because it's arid, but it's very flat there. And so, you know, if you look at people who live in essentially 15th, 16th century style housing uh, and are farming and are living in areas which, as you can see, the river's meandering. So all those meanders uh, can become one big river when there's enough rain and these right. people are living in the middle of that like how do i come up with a solution this is not right. easy you know uh so i think that's a very big challenge here in a way to think about climate change or no climate change that's really the challenge and uh the climate change story of course is clickbait now because every media group latches onto that and all the questions i get when i'm being interviewed go to you know how, what role has climate change played in this? You know, right. and my response is: think about the people who are there. Is 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 there something that we should be doing about this climate change or no climate change? And I've been involved in the climate change story since 1988. I bought into this very early as a non-climate scientist. And 40 some years, you know, 40ish years later, I would say we've made progress in terms of you know public awareness of this issue we have made progress in terms of the fact that every politician now knows these words but their actions don't really go anywhere close to addressing that issue and in the meantime we have impacts that exist with or without climate change that are really concerning and nothing much is being done about those because the political conversation is about carbon it's not about floods and droughts in some ways, I think that the scientific community blew it because they chose two degrees C warming as the benchmark. And two degrees C warming means nothing to the common person around the world. Uh, the impacts are hydrologic by and large. Uh, and through hydrology into agriculture and food, through hydrology into you know various other things. And we have lost that thread completely. Uh, there's you know some talk about adaptation to climate, yeah. There's lots of talk about climate adaptation, but no investment and no actions that are really right. taking place in that area. So that's that's my concern when people start asking me questions. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I've been on that same trajectory. I, I first reported on climate change, global warming in 1988 on the cover of a magazine, Discover. And, you know, I reported every angle. Corey, Dean and I, uh, as editor and writer, we, we pursued so many aspects of this. And I completely shifted my own frame, including as a journalist, to climate risk. I, th I think if we put climate risk in the foreground, in other words, if that's the, the key question, then climate change is one driver of risk, meaning a change in the hazard, whether it's uh, rain, uh, a storm. And then what are the other things that determine risk? And it's a pretty simple formula. As, as as geographers and, and disaster experts keep telling me, it's exposure and vulnerability. How many people, how much stuff, and this is Corey Dean's books on coastal risk, and uh, what's the capacity of those people or things to withstand a hazard? And so if, if you wake up as a reporter or as a mayor, <laughs> And, and every day you, you use that word. And then of course, how do you reduce the risk that leads to the this issue of there's your menu and the menu is, well, maybe in Pakistan, it's urbanization actually getting people off the, the land. Uh, but of course, you know, it's a, as you said, that's a huge question. And Corey Dean, uh, you want to talk about the media. Well, you know what, I'm, you... To, I'm, I'm not to interrupt, but well, of yeah. course I'm interrupting, but, um... Uh, do you happen to know, you might, you might be one of the few people who would happen to know, when was the first time that the uh, National Academy of Sciences 
gave a report to the White House on um, human-induced climate change as a threat. 1965. Yes, the Johnson administration. Right. And it's a very interesting thought experiment to think, suppose we had taken this question seriously in 1965 as a society, and suppose people, you know, everywhere had figured out we have to do something about this. How would life be different today from the way it actually is? But um, there, I can recommend, uh, if this is appropriate, um, a very interesting book by a man named Ma Ma Max Bazerman at the Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And it's called Predictable Surprises. All right. You know this book? I know the work and not the book. Okay. It's, and it's a very, in my opinion, very interesting and um, accurate description of why, from his perspective, a company can see right in front of it an existential threat to its entire business and do nothing about it. And the factors that he cites, I think, are highly analogous to factors that exist in politics that, that derail any kind of meaningful action until inaction is no longer possible. And I hope we're, I don't mean to say this, I think it's a good thing, but I believe anyway that we are now coming to the place where inaction is no longer possible. And that, um, you know, therefore we might actually see something useful, but um, it's going to take a lot of suffering to cause us to get there. Yeah, and, and this is where, uh, and maybe we'll get back to Joe Deep on this as well. Um, the spin that you see in, um, around a disaster like this ends up, as Manu said, framed by the politics, or in this case, the geopolitics, the, the Paris Agreement, the underlying framework convention on climate change from 1992, um, essentially argue the only way a country theoretically can pursue uh, the funds that have actually not yet even come through this process, but if they were there, is to demonstrate a an impact from literally from greenhouse gas driven climate change. That's in the fundamental 1992 treaty. That the so that's why if you're a prime minister, uh, you frame everything around climate change, global warming, as opposed to what did we do as a country or not do to uh, f to get ahead of this kind of threat? Monsoon rains are you know thousands of years old, and and maybe Manu we could talk about sort of past flood histories um, a little bit too. Uh, the Indus River, that meander, you know, as it gets hemmed in is, is an artificial construct. And, and the Mississippi is flooding right now too. And uh, we've been through this drill all around the country, but but we, we, we tend to, our structures, our conversation is framed by, in this case, COP27, the next climate discussion, where loss and damage will be a key question. Uh, so, you know, no one uh, in a developing country is going to go there and say, yeah, you know, we need to change our development. <laughs> or, or, we need to do something on the ground as opposed to uh, we need you all in the West to stop flooding the atmosphere with CO2. So, Joy Deep, I, I know you, I think uh, Earth Journalism Network is sending a bunch of reporters as always to um, COP27, but like, and, and, and this, Corey, this gets, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions and we can all just talk about it. Okay. Uh, you know, we tend to do stenography still reporting. Uh, the headlines the other day were, there were a bunch of them around the statement by Pakistan's um, prime minister, where he said, literally, uh, I have it in my story. Let me see. I'll, I'll show you the words, what he, what he said, and then we'll get to, uh, he said, it's right here. We are suffering from it, but it is not our fault at all. And that was in dozens of headlines. Uh, but no one's, I, you know, I basically said, <clears throat> not questioning that and just reporting it is the same as when Donald Trump was saying chloroquine, it's really good for COVID. And we wouldn't just say, the president said chloroquine is good for COVID. We would, if you're a responsible journalist, you would say, well, what do we actually know about that? So, so I, so there, I laid out a lot of stuff. So maybe uh, Joy Deep in terms of the journalism network, um, 
you know, how do you how do you get at these 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 tough problems? Okay, Frame, framing. Uh, you know how do you how do you get away yeah. from people framing the way the, the way we frame it is the way actually Manu put it. Uh, it's simple. Uh, it's now I think a fairly well established frame that okay, let's take this particular flood, which happened because of a sudden deluge over a very short period of time from a depression that actually started in the Bay of Bengal, entered the mainland Asia through Orissa in India, went right through the breadth of India, Orissa, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and then entered Pakistan from the India-Pakistan border and uh, in Sindh and Balochistan where it hit the mountains. And that's where the maximum rainfall happened. But by the way, they, it left a trail of flooding and destruction right through from Orissa uh, uh, till Balochistan all the way. Mm. That is the cause. And that kind of uh, extra numbers of depression, worse depressions, more severe cases of monsoon uncertainty and sudden cloud bursts like this, those are now fairly well established as the cause of human-induced climate change. So is the faster receding of glaciers, which again added what more water flow to the already flooded areas and worsen the floods. So when the Prime Minister of Pakistan says that, yeah, it's due to climate change, he's not at fault. But when he says the truth, but not the whole truth. The cause is climate change, but the damage is not due only to climate change. The damage is also due to efforts to jacket rivers that naturally meander, mm -hmm. efforts by putting in dams, which uh, for so-called flood control, so when, which constantly fail to control floods by pu pushing people into the floodplains uh, because of uh, they are being moved into the floodplains because the the land in which they used to live is being taken over by rich people and commercial interests by moving people away and displacing them for so-called development projects and if you oppose them, you are called anti-national, irrespective of the country you live in. So these are all factors that contribute in a huge way to the damage. They are not the main cause of the flooding or the drought or the early heat wave, but they're hugely responsible for the extent of the damage. Exactly. So it's uh, very important to realize that we are having a situation where two very negative things are joining. Yeah, and uh, Manu, could you weigh in on that? Yeah, no, I think I can't put it better than that. That's that's exactly right. Uh, the you know, and I think what Joydeep said, I will re-emphasize that this is not peculiar to Pakistan. Uh, it's a regional yeah. issue. It's an African issue. It's a Latin American issue. We, we don't escape this. The manifestation varies by region, but you know the dynamics are basically the same. Uh, there's The only thing he didn't mention is there's always the element of corruption in these things, where yeah, yeah. Uh, you, know, you bring in external donors, uh, because this idea that preparation and investment in uh, reducing the exposure is worth more than donations after the fact, which is what's happening right now, to the tune of you know half a billion dollars, uh, like that money, that kind of money has been spent after the last big flood in Pakistan, as an example. There's very little to show for it, and I'm not saying that Pakistan is corrupt. I'm saying uniformly, all of these places yeah. face that kind of a challenge, and also you know some sometimes there is a very peculiar way of doing these analyses that leads to increasing the hazard for poor people, which is also what Joydeep said. Uh, just as an example, in the US, 
uh, I attended a meeting um, the first year of the pandemic or just before you know things were shut down and there were big floods on the Mississippi there were big floods elsewhere and there was a meeting of 38 different city managers uh, and I was invited to talk about climate and floods uh, you know and it's vacuous to go around doing that in a way but I was more interested in listening to what they had to say and there was an army U.S. Army Corps of Engineers person there and what he said was really interesting he said that you know where we are able to do flood control projects and justify them on economic basis because that's part of the charter that's given to them are places where there is something of value so where there are poor people the benefit cost ratio analysis exactly. is not favorable so we can't do anything to protect them and i was thinking that's really interesting so basically you're saying you're creating a chronic situation where you're going to keep pouring in money after the fact but you are not willing to do anything before the fact and he said that's exactly right so you know even in a place which is as sophisticated as the us we have this issue uh, of perpetuating the the spending that happens post event rather than actually thinking about what we really should do to change the picture yeah there's a term i've gotten used to these days called maladaptation and that's exactly what you're talking about uh, jd yeah. yeah yeah i was going to uh, i agree and i was just going to add that i uh, i hope you people remember that pakistan right now is taking a loan from china of over 50 billion dollars yeah. to build a cascade of dams on the indus a cascade of seven dams on the indus uh, and can you just imagine what will happen in this kind of a situation of cloud bursts induced by climate change, uh, glaciers receding thanks to climate change, and it all comes down a cascade of dams because those dams are definitely not going to be able to stop it. Although that is there in the project report, they will stop small floods, but when it comes to the big ones, they will not be able to stop it. And, and we know this again, again, and again. So the Pakistan is, or any developing country, is perfectly right when they are demanding reparations, when they're demanding compensation from rich countries when it comes to climate-induced damage. On loss and damage, I'm very clear that loss and damage has been very carefully stopped mainly by the American delegation at repeated climate summits. I've seen them at, do, mm -hmm. at it since 2007 at every climate COP. Same here. They, they have various ways of doing it, and they do it very successfully through their lawyers. And that is, from my point of view, not right. And there is a strong case for developing countries demanding, and they should get, loss and damage money. They definitely should get more adaptation money. You know, even today, the Green Climate Fund is again broke. Mm, uh, again, it has no money. And I know that it's supposed to give 50% of its money to adaptation funds, uh, but uh, adaptation projects. But if you actually see it, that is simply not happening. So the little money that's going into climate is going into renewable energy projects, solar and wind, very good. It should. Right. It definitely should. But the situation is right now is that uh, it's no longer a case of, you know, stopping uh, the house from catching fire in future. The house is already on fire and we have to deal with that. Yeah. And, and you know, he's even setting aside the loss and damage track, as you said, just the basic existing green climate fund, uh, the money that the hundred billion dollars a year that was committed to back in 2010 or so from rich countries, that's that's just not even there. So that's separate from the loss and damage. So it's just a complete and utter. This is the uh, the adaptation gap report that the UN puts yeah. out each year uh, and you know the the media actually I, I write about it but the media the media this gets back to Corey's realm um, <laughs> you know we write about the emissions 
gap. The emissions gap report gets all the coverage. The adaptation gap report gets no coverage because we're all interested in energy. Energy is where the money is. You know what I mean? Like this sort of carbon money. And, and, and we end up ignoring this vulnerability part. And this, is, uh, this report says there's a huge win for risk from more, uh, theoretically, from more focus on redu reducing vulnerability. Uh, and that's something that drives me a little crazy. Personally. Yeah, Andy, you know, before you, before Corey speaks, I just want to say that I've been, for the last few weeks, I've been chasing a story on climate risk insurance. So I've been mm -hmm. chasing Munich Re and Swiss Re exactly for this, what you're talking about. And so far, I hope I'll get more info and be able to do the story. So far, uh, what I'm finding is that actual information actual dollar numbers are really few and far between and there there is there are so many assumptions so many estimates and guesstimates that it's very difficult even uh, for a reinsurance companies as sophisticated as munich re or swiss re to be actually able to do anything about it yeah well, well anyway sorry, quick, Corey. no i would just say I think the insurance industry is going to be as already a driver of action because that's these things are hitting them in their pocketbooks. But what what is interesting and um, uh, I would have to say horrifying to me um, is you're now starting to hear people um, say we need to establish a fire a national fire insurance program comparable to the National Flood Insurance Program, which in my opinion has done more than anything else to encourage dangerous and unwise and ultimately incredibly yeah. expensive development on the coast. And they are now, people are now saying the only uh, institution that, that can provide insurance coverage for people building in the, in what Roger Kennedy called the flame zone. And uh, he wrote a wonderful book years ago, Wildfire and Americans, and that's a really good example of somebody being way ahead of the curve. And there was before the big outbreaks of huge fires. He died a while ago, but his book was completely prescient on all of this. And um, people were even then talking about, we have to have a federal program to indemnify people who build in the flame zone. And instead of saying, maybe it's not such a great idea to put so much of our infrastructure in a place like but oh boy. I, yeah, it's a, a yeah. lack of insurance is um, that's an issue. And well, never mind. I could talk a long time about this, but I'll try not to. But but it's a really it, it's the same phenomenon. Uh, it's the same phenomenon. It really well, is. It's, it's a wholesale shifting yeah. of the economic burden from the people who mostly who can afford to buy elaborate property on the coast most of them have a certain amount of money it's shifting the cost of their insurance uh, the burden of that cost from them onto the taxpayers and uh that's a real serious fairness issue if you ask me so you're going to see this after the uh, in the aftermath of the pakistan floods because in pakistan uh, the much of the agricultural holdings are actually held by very rich farmers and there are relatively few of them they have taken insurance while most of the numbers that you are seeing of people dying etc cetera, etc cetera, are landless agricultural labor yeah, yeah so the rich that, farmers yeah. are going to take their insurance and, or, and laugh all the way to the bank while landless agricultural labor are going to continue to suffer very very badly and and by the way that's exactly the same issue in the united states i, I wrote several pieces uh, and i know manu thinks about this all the time uh well, just what you were saying, Manu, about um, that discussion about uh, adaptation money. If you don't have the capacity to know how to apply for a FEMA grant in the United States, then you're you're standing way at the back of a line where the billionaires out in the Hamptons. Not only does the logic of the law line up with them because it's based on financial risk, but your capacity to pursue uh, aid is hindered by your development uh, level or your poverty or your 
uh, if you're prejudiced community, community prejudiced against because of the history and the like. I want to show you guys, I think I've got this clip queued up. This is about Madagascar, but it, it relates to another First issue. Fact, I wonder if we would have been better off with an intergovernmental panel on climate risk. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, that's part of the problem, right? So I think the IPCC has actually moved on, but the climate policy world is still very much in a, in a climate only silo. And we, 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 are, we are about to recreate the problem that we've had with adaptation now in the loss and damage space, where again, we're seeing climate impacts materialize because of something in the climate hazard, but actually in places where vulnerability is high. And we're starting to do all these funny incremental cost type reasonings again that we've learned 20 years ago work if you have a seawall you get 10 centimeters of sea level rise in your projections you add 10 centimeters of of of, uh, of seawall to your existing seawall and you're back at the same level of safety that would work for a country like the netherlands if sea level rise was our only problem now even in a country like the netherlands it's a combination with a delta where where river runoff is increasing and then another year there's a drought so suddenly we need to retain the water so even there, it doesn't work, let alone places like Bangladesh, where there's no seawall to start with. So the most effective solution would be a better early warning system. And they have invested in that and they've saved millions of lives, literally doing so, uh, which we can learn something of in, 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 Bang in, in, uh, in Germany, right? I mean, Bangladesh had a, a massive super typhoon where only 124 people died, whereas we lost right. 200 lives in the heart of Europe because okay. we're not well prepared for stuff that's coming our way. And again, it was, for instance, an, a, a house with disabled people where we just didn't have the warning systems mm -hmm. functional to get people out of harm's way in time. So I think this is a very universal story, uh, but of course, uh, and that is our humanitarian reality every day. So that's also where I'm happy to see people like Lisa and, and to some extent myself also representing a, an international humanitarian network in the IPCC. I think this voice is getting stronger. Um, but it's, it's our daily reality. So it's, it's also frustrating to some extent that in Glasgow, we still see so much of these conversations in that climate silo. Whereas if you're on the ground in these villages in, in Madagascar, it is so bloody obvious. Yeah. Now, doesn't that feel resonant with everything we were just saying about uh, Pakistan? Uh, Manu uh, popped off for a second. I'm not sure if he uh, had, had to leave uh, permanently, but uh, Corey, all this relates to your book, uh, your book project, the, the first one, and uh, to what you think about every day. So if, is there a way to break this down toward uh, solutions? You know, what is uh, something that could really concretely, let's just focus on coastal risk if you want, because that's where you're dug uh, in. You mostly. know, I, so I keep on thinking about Max Bazerman and, um, mm -hmm. and his insight, which is like blindingly obvious, except uh, no one's acting on it. What, what he would say is, if you know that you have some kind of a problem that poses an existential risk to your, and I would say on the coast, you know, to our society on the coast, why are you not doing something about it? And so he says, well, because this scenario is this, and we've seen this play out again and again. Um, you can say, uh, we need to do X, Y, and Z in order to prevent this disaster. And it's, uh, we're going to spend a whole bunch of money to do it and we're going to accomplish it and we won't have the disaster. And mm -hmm. so what that means is by the time the disaster does not occur, if you're the politician, you may be out of office. You may even right. be dead. Even worse, if the good outcome is that a disaster doesn't happen, people may not realize that they've received a benefit. Exactly. The only thing that they have experienced is the pain that you inflicted on them by making them pay for whatever the action was that prevented the disaster. And we've seen, I don't know if you know that this guy became like the poster child for uh, political climate victims in the United States, Bob Inglis of South Carolina, a mm -hmm. state that has massive uh, coastal issues to deal with. Um, and by the way, was the... Uh, was the site of the law case, Lucas v. South Carolina, that the property, the the uh, paradigmatic property rights case when this issue was litigated. But anyway, he was a very conservative Republican member of Congress, had a practically perfect record on, um, you know, voting for conservative causes in a conservative Republican district. And he came out uh, and started talking about climate change as an issue that we needed to do something about. 
and he was primaried, and that was the end of his career in the Congress. And um, as long as um, as long as our political leadership is not, you know, ready to embrace reality, uh, we're in trouble. And and I'm not, I kept to mention this. All this happened to me in Rhode Island. I was invited to join a an organization in Rhode Island, and I had to be interviewed by people for this. And one of them was a, a Republican. Um, you know, a, um, a leading Republican in the state. In fact, he had run for the Senate. He was the Republican Party's nominee for the U.S. Senate at one point. And um, we started talking about climate and he said, oh, you are one of those people who thinks climate, human caused climate change is for real. That's not exactly how he put it, but that was what he meant. And I said, yes. And he said, um, well, anyway, what are you going to do about it? And I said, that's our problem because we can't have a conversation about what the policy uh, options are as long as we have too many people who are turning away from the whole issue because they don't want to face it. And that's, yeah. uh, that's a, how we overcome that. I, you know, I don't know, but, but um, I, I can't remember who it was who said this, but I quoted him in my first book, nature bats last at the coast. And, <laughs> Yeah. This is a good, you know, nature is batting last now for us. Nature is is uh, um, telling us in Pakistan with these monsoon floods and so on. Nature is speaking to us. And there's only a certain amount of time before we have to start paying attention. Yeah, well, and uh, Joy Deep, you deal with this uh, uh, in the news context as well. Uh, that, that in this river, rivers don't like to be hemmed in. And we've learned this over and over again, uh, separate from the coastal issue. But you, you know, the Indus River is one of the rivers of history. It gives India its name. And this is a river that, till the 2010 floods, failed to reach the sea. It had been dammed at so many points. It, for a few years, after the 2010 floods, it started reaching the sea because there was so much water. And then again, it stopped reaching the sea. It just dies in the delta before it reaches the sea. Now, with this year's flooding, it is again reaching the sea. But you, I can foresee that that will stop again. The entire delta economy of the Indus is in tatters. The entire fishing fleet they don't know what to do because they're all the mouths of the Indus. And by the way, all the mouths of the Ganges as well are now so badly hit by salinity with the sea level rising and salt water coming in that they, there is very large scale exodus from these areas. Karachi is filled with people from Keti Bandar and all, all, all those fishing ports. On the Indus Delta. Uh, Calcutta is filled with people from the Sundarbans. Dhaka is filled with people from the Sundarbans uh, because they cannot live on the coast anymore. It's just too saline. We, right. had, we have done so many stories now uh, from the uh, both from the Sundarbans as uh, from as well as from the Indus Delta uh, uh, that uh, the, you, the water is unfit to drink. It's just too salty. And they've got used to it because it's the, the salinity has gone up slowly. So they keep drinking it. And you are getting cases of preeclampsia in pregnant women because drinking, uh, they, they're having too much salt thanks to the water that they're drinking and using in their cooking. So their blood pressure goes up. Everybody's uh, on the coast now has high blood pressure. And when it comes to pregnant women, it becomes a life-threatening thing for them and their babies. And this is the kind of situation we are having. Where will there has been in, in Calcutta, by the way, there is a strong debate going on that of the four and a half million people who live in the Indian part of the Sundarbans, there is no option but to remove one and a half million of them. And so uh, there is this huge debate going on. Where are we going to house one and a half million people? Uh, so 
we have the situation where these climate impacts are hitting home on a daily basis. You are you started this talk, Andy, by talking about the early heat wave this year yeah. in South yeah. Asia. Right. The early heat wave in South in South Asia, which started in March, we, we there was no spring in South Asia this year, has taken away a quarter of the wheat crop of South Asia, and now. We have this weird situation where we have not only floods, by the way, we not only have floods right now. Right now, we simultaneously have floods and droughts. Right. Large parts of the rice growing areas <coughs> of Bangladesh and India have are in drought at the moment, while contiguous areas are flooded. So the this year, not only the wheat crop is gone, the rice sowing, which happens in the monsoon, is down by about 30 percent so we'll have ab about 30 percent less of rice so the two main crops wheat and rice are going to be very bad there's going to be a food price inflation again as a result and this is a, a cycle that vicious cycle that keeps getting worse all the time so when it's that's why while we are reporting on this we keep <coughs> talking of the water energy food nexus because it's the energy part of it that puts the greenhouse gases there and the impacts are showing first in water and through water in food. Right. Corey, um, I, want, I want to kind of conclude this part of the conversation with the, the newsroom issue. And now here's one I know you both think about, which is... Um, well, it used to be called ghettoization. Uh, science news was in the science section. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental news was within that. And for the average person now, uh, you know, polls show, I, I assume, unless and until there's a, these kinds of disasters in South Asia, people are interested about the economy, about jobs, about growth. Uh, and if you're not looking for these stories, you don't see them. Um, I, I love Earth Journalism Network. I I love uh, the New York Times climate coverage uh, uh, the, these days. But if you look at the Times homepage right now, I'll just show you. Here, here's the New York Times right now. Oh, there you go. Jobs. U.S. hiring slowed. Uh, this is a global paper. And uh, no, that's, that's, uh, private, private swimming pools. There we go. <laughs> that, I think, is... Um the most uh, regrettable part of the shift from reading on paper to reading online. Mm -hmm. Because when people read online, they tend to go for what they want and they find it and they click on it and that's that. Or they're attracted by some piece of clickbait and that's that. Whereas if you're reading a newspaper on paper, almost by definition, you're turning the pages. And so something can catch your eye and you'll find yourself reading something you would not necessarily have sought out. And I don't know if you remember, Andy, when the, when the uh, newspaper expanded, it's the number of sections from four to as many as, I don't know, six or eight. Mm -hmm. And Science Times now finally got its own section. We didn't have to share our section with the arts and culture coverage, which used to have the back of, of the uh, section that had Science Times on its cover. And people uh, would say to me, oh, isn't that great? You know, you have your own section now. And I always said, no, I love the fact that we shared the section with culture because that meant that anybody who was looking for the television listings or the movie ads or, you know, the theater reviews or music events or whatever, by definition, they had to turn the pages of Science Times to get to that. And I thought, you know, every single one of those people, that was a chance for us to draw the readers in to the uh, science coverage that we were doing. And we don't have that anymore in that section. And uh, I don't think that is um, helpful. I think that siloization is a real serious issue, especially in a country like ours, where a lot of people uh, are afraid of science. That's a topic that is badly taught. Um, 
And, uh, you know, people's experience with it in school is to be alternately bored and humiliated. And they don't <laughs> necessarily seek it out. And, I, and we're not, we're making it easy for them to avoid it, which is, uh, in my opinion, a great error. So. And how does that play uh, for you, Jody? It's the, same. it's the same. I completely agree with Cornelia. And uh, for years, I've been saying that I hate the phrase environmental journalist. I hate the phrase science journalist because it ghettoizes those reporters in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And then that ghettoization moves on to the media outlet, whatever it may be. And I completely take the point that uh, uh, the reading newspapers online has worsened the situation. We are all now looking and reading and talking in echo chambers. And uh, just uh, uh, and desperately trying to get out of these silos. I wish I knew how to. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is either. I can only say that I don't like what I'm seeing. I think it's yeah, not at all. Not no, and the um, sadly the algorithms that control virtually everything people see online and their feeds um, are being more and more torqued toward um, non-productive. Yeah, now, now nowadays Twitter no longer gives me the main tweets of the day, right? It just yeah. goes by what I've been reading you know, on Twitter for the last whatever days, and it gives me those feeds. The, the other thing that I think is, uh, you know, from a larger societal perspective, is really pernicious, is that you know the the um, <clears throat> the elites, the knowledge elites, the business elites. These people will always be casting a wide net because they understand that they need to know what's going on in the world. But the knowledge will be con increasingly concentrated at a certain strata of society. And when we have to make big time social decisions, I'm afraid what we're gonna see is, um, you know, some group of self-appointed experts in a windowless room somewhere thinking for a few days and then coming out and telling the rest of us what we're gonna do. And that is not uh, a helpful approach if you want to maintain a democratic outlook, in my opinion. And by yeah. the way, that was one of the uh, that was one of the points that the people who in, um, worked on the early uh, work on CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic um, uh, developments, and they actually put uh, had a paper in Science in which they said. There needs to be a wide social conversation about what is the appropriate use of this technology, right. and it should include everybody. And they had listed, you know, researchers, physicians, patients, whatever, but then on and on and on to members of the clergy, ethicists, philosophers, and then ordinary people. And they, I, they actually called for a moratorium on the work until such conversations could take place. I am not aware of any such conversation going on anywhere. I mean, maybe, and I just haven't heard of it, but um, but I think from from a, the perspective of society, uh, that's just not good. That is not a good situation. Well, I hope we can uh, work together to figure out ways forward despite these challenges. Uh, I, I think uh, having these conversations helps a little bit. Uh, newsrooms can play a role, I think, um, I moved toward blogging because it was a, well, I was at the New York Times because it was more, much more interactive with readers um, as opposed to me always framing a story. Is like, is the journalist going out interviewing people and then telling their story back to them is very unidirectional. Um, but the blog, again, was only seen by people who are already stumbling on it because they are thinking about uh, climate risk or the like. So it, 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 th this is just, I think it's one of the key frontiers and, and the big uh, working with the big entities like Facebook and Twitter and figuring out ways forward feels to me uh, super important. You know, maybe a last thought from, from Joy Deep and I'm going to pull, pull up something that actually really shows the potential to flip the, the script. Uh, with something like Twitter, but you know, so where do you go from here? What's the story through the rest of the year for you and your reporting team? Well, uh, I think we'll be doing follow-ups to the floods, especially the Pakistan floods. 
uh, uh, definitely for the, at least the next couple of months. Uh, and then ta keep taking it from there. We're already planning a whole series of follow-ups. And well, uh, like everybody else, uh, within a couple of months, it will be COP time. And we'll mm -hmm. get stuck uh, with COP. And so that will go on. But to answer uh, that wider question that Cornelia posed and you posed, Andy, I think it's a very important thing. And I've been telling science editors in various media outlets that you people, science editors need to do more reports based on the work of social scientists. That uh, yes. when you are when you are doing stories, uh, when you are doing stories on a flood, you are you are talking to hydrologists, you are talking to irrigation engineers, you are talking to other scientists and ecologists. Why aren't you talking to the anthropologists and the political scientists? Uh, and why aren't you talking to the sociologists and I've been trying to do that. I've been trying to push that. It's not easy because there are problems from uh, uh, there are issues from all sides, especially the physical science people. I do get a lot of blowback uh, on that, but I think it's something that I would like to push. I think you're absolutely right. And I'm but there are a lot of people in the natural sciences who denigrate the whole field of social yeah. science. Yeah. Yeah. And yet That's when you problem. look at the problems that confront us, if you look mm. at the problems of climate change, yeah. we already have plenty of information to tell us we need to act to uh, you know, all of these different aspects of the problem. And we're, the fact that we're not doing it is a social science issue, not a science issue. Yeah. And the yeah. same is true with all, you know, anything you want to point to, healthcare, all kinds of things that people think, oh, it's a science question. Well, it's a social science question. Yeah. But until we focus on that, we are going to be going around in circles, if you ask me. Yeah. But we don't, yeah. there's, there's a real, um, the other thing that I think, and having been in, uh, having been teaching a bit, I think there's definitely this idea in academia that true uh, interdisciplinary work is almost by definition not as good as siloed work, work that focuses on one narrow thing. They denigrate that as well. And um, there needs to be a uh, there needs to be a lot of attitude adjustment before we're going to go forward, in my opinion. I'm glad to hear you um, talk about this, Joy Deep. And also, I was really struck by the whole idea that when you're reporting on a situation like that, you need to be on the ground talking to the people who are experiencing the, you know, right. the situation. Oh, absolutely. Wet firewood. Well, yeah. you know, that's a really, really good example. That is yeah. going to, that is going yeah. to come back to bite people in a big way going forward. Right. Yeah. I, this I, is, I can tell you that uh, within a couple of months, you're going to pay more for your pistachios because <laughs> that entire crop is gone. Yeah, and that, that'll play forward. I, you know, I, to me, the one thing, I, this is what I began with, I think, uh, the one pathway, especially for the media, that could be beneficial is to shift the frame to the most fundamental way to look at what's happening in the world, who is in danger, and what to do about it. And it's risk. It goes back to, there's an old book I have by Victor Cohn, I think, reporting on risk. Um, risk, that basic formula, uh, risk is hazard times exposure, factoring in vulnerability. And when you do that, the whole story landscape changes and it's, a, it's impossible to get spun by somebody saying it's climate change or someone saying it's this and that. I want to just show, this is a very brief comment by one of my favorite geographers, who's a great climate scientist, Diana Liverman, who just retired from University of Arizona. She, in one of these conversations one day, she said something that really, really nails this. And I hope you, maybe we could use this as a bit of a takeaway. So just listen to what she says here. I've got this queued up right. Oh, this, is this the right one? No, oh, I have the wrong one, but this is, this is re relevant. This is, this, this is the, um, that framing I was telling you about. Let me go back to the beginning. Maybe I don't have it. Oh, I had the wrong video queued up. 
I'll I'll um play that uh, in a minute. G give me one last second because it's it's worth. Um, oh, here we go. It's vulnerability Liverman. It just really kind of gets at what we're all grappling with here. I have a feeling this will be uh, resonant for you, as resonant for you as it is for me. When we talk about climate risk, some people still just think, oh, it's the probability of a heat wave. But we need right. to think about risk not as the probability of the heat wave, but as the probability of harm. Just that one line. When we talk about climate risk, some people think it's just the probability of the heat wave, meaning climate change is changing floods which is there's many issues there but we need to think about risk not only as the probability not as the probability of the heat wave but as the probability of harm and then it's like harm to whom in addition to sort of population growth um, and uh, other factors poverty is massively important in explaining right. vulnerability. and we see a lot of parts of the world even though we've brought you know millions of people out of poverty um that there are parts of the world where aspects of poverty make people very vulnerable so if you're a poor person yeah exactly great great example but you know the work we've done in uh, mexico and in other regions shows that if you're poor and they privatize your water it makes you more vulnerable if you're an indigenous community and somebody steals your land, you're vulnerable. There are so many ways in which addressing basic social welfare can reduce vulnerability, whether it's in New Orleans or Mexico City. So, uh, and we're seeing that right now with the heat wave here. It's the poor who can't afford to pay for air conditioning, who can't afford to um insulate their homes and who are living on the streets or working in outdoors occupations in 115 degrees fahrenheit so that's uh you know you just translate the same thing to the situation in pakistan it's the poor those rural poor that manu lal remember he said that very high population density in rural areas they're the ones who are in harm's way and then you, in the meantime, you have dams being built with China's Chinese money to heart to create electricity for other needs in the Himalayas. So it's just a real, but if we do that, just going back to that risk formula, it's a way at least to test those other assertions. Like when a prime minister says, this is not at all our fault, it's all global warming. Mm -hmm. And for the media, I hope there's some prospect. And I, I think this gets back to training and, uh, I did some training with uh, the Global Press Network, uh, female journalists around the world, where you put the risk question in the foreground instead of the climate change question. And it, change, just, it creates a whole landscape of stories. It identifies accountability. It takes us forward instead of being stuck. And it takes us out of the frame of climate science to the frame of what people actually care about. Um, I would love it if you, I'm gonna dive into this other question that Corey had mentioned to the Greenland story. Um, but if you have to go, Joy Deep, I know it's the evening there now. You have supper and, and other obligations. Uh, so I'm going to play an interview the, I did. The beauty of the... South Asia is that we don't eat before nine in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> so so hold on for a second. Let me, let me just... Uh, so this is like a, a little closing, somewhat separate um, uh, question here. Uh, let me just... Uh, Put up the right screen so the news there was some science news this week um there was a paper that came out i think on monday uh, in one of the nature journals and uh, here's some of the headlines zombie ice from greenland will raise sea level 10 inches uh, that was the ap story uh oh but yes zombies get attention <laughs> there's been other look at that they got all right yeah, here, here's another video. Greenland zombie ice sheet will raise sea levels well, by you know, 20 somebody, inches. Someone thought that up, and they were thinking about clickbait. They were not Absolutely. thinking about hydrology, for sure. Yeah, and the paper, you know, when you actually look at the paper, it doesn't get at the question of when. And this gets to my 
point at the very beginning about what matters to society when you think about sea level rise is not so much how high, but how high, how soon. Uh, I, I chose to live in a house that's 16 feet above sea level, high, high, high tide here in Maine, uh, knowing that seas are rising for centuries to come. Uh, but I, I made a judgment based on what I've thought about in terms of climate. And uh, so let me just play this interview, which is with uh, um, uh, Lee Stearns, who I had, we did like how to read a science paper, essentially, it was how to, how to read and then how to think about how the media cover it. And uh, if you can stay on and just give some comment, some thoughts, that'd be great. Uh, uh, Jody, if you deal with the sea level rise too. So while I queue that up, if you have a, uh, some thoughts, both of you, on, um, yeah, well, sea level rise is not something theoretical for the people who live along the coast. You, you know that yeah. from your reports in South Carolina, in Louisiana, yeah. in Florida. Uh, yeah. And I know it from my reports all over Asia. In my, uh, and, yeah, uh, in I, my news book that, the, that came out a couple of years ago, it's called Making Sense of Science. And it's a guide to for ordinary people and how to understand what's going on with all this. I have a section on how to read a scientific paper ah, and, um, and uh, what the point that I make again and again is um, and, and I approach this as a person who is I read a lot of scientific papers and I'm very vastly ignorant of science I have no science training of any kind um, but um, what I tell them in what I tell my readers in this section is that you may not when you read the paper you may come away with a lot of questions about what is it actually saying and what does it actually mean. And the, if, if that's your position, you've still gained something important because at least you know what you do not know about this issue. Right. And you're not going to be as ready to just accept assertions about things if that you haven't personally thought about. And so, it's, I guess it's better if everybody knows everything, but no one is able to know everything. So we're always going to be dealing from a position of ignorance, but at least you need to kind of try to figure out what, where, uh, where are the blank places um, that, in which you are ignorant. So. And uh, to me, uh, here's the, uh, the interview. Um, I, I, I'll describe tips for readers uh, like, look for words or words that are absent. So if you see a headline that says 10 inches, you immediately are thinking, okay, by when? Or if you see the word if, meaning sea level rise could, could, could be a, a meter by 2100 if we stay on the highest track for emissions, which is this 8.5 question that gets batted around. So those are like little tags that you yourself can get at so so again thanks uh, grab your tea or your coffee and or your beer uh, and just let's let me just play a little bit of this at least this is lee stearns this is andy revkin at the columbia climate school longtime journalist on the climate beat since uh, the 1980s which is a weird thing half my life <laughs> and i'm a and i'm a senior citizen um I'm here today with Lee Stearns, who is a glaciologist who teaches and does research at the University of Kansas um, and is deeply dug in on what makes big ice move and not move. Uh, she has worked in, in the uh, polar regions. Uh, this is, I assume that's Greenland. Uh, not, uh, that's Greenland, yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, in Greenland, which, and there's lots of important questions about Greenland's ice. It's a when I wrote about the ice sheet in Greenland in 2004 for the New York Times, I did some pretty careful cross-checking of volumes. And it turns out it's basically the uh, volume of water that's in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, if some, if, if God or some great force came up and flipped that like a pancake up, up on, on, dry, <laughs> on dry land, that's the same mass of ice. So it's a lot of ice and it's melting. Uh, the uh, last year there was a uh, rain up on up high, um, the uh, the balance, the mass of how much uh, snow is coming on top versus how much ice is being shed and water melting is uh, a really important question for anyone living on a coast or anyone depending on a coast. You know, supply chains. So anyway, Lee, we we've been talking. Uh, you came up 
yesterday, uh, this week, in a, uh, some of the news coverage of a new paper, really, a really valuable deep mm -hmm. dive into dynamics. And the paper had some conclusions I thought we'd, we'd go over because as readers can get sort of fuzzed out or get what I sometimes in the past have called a whiplash, like um, if, if you see one thing one day, you know, Greenland's doomed, um, ice is going to be gone, ten, ten, 10 inches of sea level rise by 2100. And then a few weeks later, someone, a paper comes out that says, well, you know, actually it's more complicated than that. And, and mm -hmm. so I'm trying to sort of help readers develop some of the habits that journalists have, can have, not always have. Uh, to get at that. So so let's just talk about this a little bit. Lee, Lee how long have you been working on glacial, glacial puzzles? Oh, great question. Probably as long as you've been doing climate stories. So, you know, since I got my, well, I started grad school in 99, I think. So I've been thinking about these issues for, for a while with research in Antarctica and Greenland and now the Himalayas um, and Alaska mm -hmm. as well. So, I, I mean, I think there a lot of really interesting parts of this paper. Uh, and I really do like that they're using a new technique. I think we often get a little bit siloed in using the same kinds of models, the same assumptions, the same tunings to make our estimates. And this uses a, a totally new approach, which I think is really needed in our field. Um, they're not tuning a model, they're, they're just using observations and kind of extrapolating that um that forward and, and I, I think there's no doubt that greenland is not stable in its current climate <laughs> that's you know it is gonna melt it's too warm it's too far south um for it yeah. to sustain as an ice sheet and we've known we've known that for a while and so i think they um they have a new approach to it and basically are looking at the long-term kind of snow in snow out budget um and are saying you know as we've known, but they just put some nice numbers on it that it's out of balance um, in terms of right. its amount of loss. And to, to society, the key question is not so much Greenland is going to contribute 23 feet to sea level rise, let's say, you know, if it all right. melted. But the question is when or how fast or how, how is this meaningful for policy now? And this paper, unless I've missed anything and i haven't been able to get a hold of the authors at least not yesterday because they're mostly from europe and mm -hmm. um, so i'll be reaching out to them too but the paper itself seems to have this language like no bounds on the time scale of greenland's committed ice loss so so they're not it's not predictive in that sense unless exactly I, I, yeah that was a good but, that was a good read on your part because i think it can and and, and the, to the author's credit they they point that out you know we're not giving it a time component our model doesn't do that um the disconnect comes in in kind of how it's interpreted they've used some of their other knowledge of how climate is changing and how ice sheet processes happen and then apply a time scale based on this educated guess i think you've highlighted there which is probably fair i mean they're pro <laughs> who knows but it's not what the paper um is quantifying the quanti the quantification or the way they're measuring how ice is changing um, gives a nice bound, but it doesn't think about how ice flows and how that changes. Um, the probably the biggest uncertainty are our emissions um, scenarios and how much we're going to emit uh, and how that's going to change our uh, our melting based on the warming that's taking place. So there there are a lot of other pieces that um, are going to impact that variability for the timing uh, which is a whole a whole other issue that it's like they they tried to avoid by focusing the study this this kind of clean mass snow in snow out way um it's just the way it, the policymakers need a time frame people living on the coast need a, a time frame and so um giving the time component is the really hard hard part yeah, and, and right, because when I was writing in 2004, um, there's been lots of science since then. Uh, the IPCC came out with its assessment of Greenland's contribution to sea level. And this paper and the authors in, in their public statements clearly are saying something that was said 10 years ago by Jim Hansen. They, they, he wrote a paper called Scientific Reticence. 
and sea level mm -hmm. rise. And, and they seem to be sort of dissing the IPCC, essentially saying, oh, you know, those of us who work on the ice and aren't modelers, uh, we have a different conclusion. And I don't know whether that, is that usefully prodding the conversation or is it more problematic? I, don't, I mean, I think these, those conversations are useful um, within, you know, maybe between scientists in, to, in terms of prodding techniques and prodding, you know, in the peer review process that is helpful. But I think it gets confusing, as you've pointed out, in the dialogue with media um, to, to be countering timeframes that have been well vetted in the IPCC with other studies. Um, so I, yeah, I, um, uh, the, some, the questioning is, is perfect um, in the right sphere. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, and I, you know, I think Jeremy Bass has had that great article recently that I think you highlighted in another right. conversation of, let's just focus on what we know. What we know is, um, you know, doomsday enough <laughs> and let's try to help, um, you know, with the policies and working with people who that will impact based on what we know. It's not it, it, getting that uncertainty and maybe getting that timing, um, yeah. you know, right down isn't as critical. I thought that was a, that was a nice way of, for me to also to think about it. Um, yeah, and Bethan Davies, who's an Antarctic um, mm -hmm. uh, focused uh, expert, she she was making the same point in some writing she did back in 2014 when I was writing about a similar study of inevitable ice loss and uh, has started in Antar Antarctica. And, and I guess I just bring it back for the average person. Like you must talk to, a, especially in, in Kansas, but you know it's just as true here in Maine or or where I used to live in the Hudson Valley, you know, people come up to you and say, so are we screwed or, or what, or what do we do? Do you have your own sort of sense of how you translate what you know and don't know about Greenland and these big ice sheets into something someone can, you know, walk away that's with? A, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great, uh, great question. I, I try not to say the, yes, we're screwed um, because I think there's a lot of research that says <laughs> that, you know, that shuts people down. And I don't think that is, productive or or true. There are a lot of things that are um, that we need to change clearly in equity and prep being prepared and um, you know changing our infrastructure and uh, you know knowing that there are still things that we can do to that end is important and it's not false. It's not a <laughs> it's not fake sure. to, to say to say that. Um, you know, we need to to focus on some solutions and thinking about how we can get the information that we're confident about to the people who who need it and can use it in a productive way. And I, you know, I, I I think that this paper does help in some ways with that. I think, as I said earlier, give it having another study done an entirely different way gives confidence that you know of what we know. Um, uh, and I think. Yeah, when people say to me, "Are we are we screwed?" I I try to say like, uh, you know, climate is changing, and there are ways that we need to be prepared for that. Um, and but yes, I mean, absolutely, the ice sheet is changing in really unprecedented ways, and we're trying to put numbers on that um, with the yeah, scientific we, information we have. Yeah. One thing I think I found that scientists and journalists both have a hard time with is um, saying with confidence what we don't know. I think we all know mm -hmm. we should just do that, but journalism tends to focus on what's new today. Right. And so headlines, I used to write about what I call the uh, the front page thought. Mm -hmm. like a new paper mm -hmm. comes out and, the, and some jaded editor says, all right, so what's the front page thought? We know Greenland's, you know, shrinking mm -hmm. uh we already wrote about that and right. so that this tension toward oh well the front page thought is 10 inches by 2100 and because that's feels you know it has heat to it, it has uh and then what's lost sometimes in the way stories are written um, is that gets kind of 
the the unknowns get buried and or the fact mm -hmm. that this isn't actually in the paper can get yeah buried. and, and I, I mean i think it's as you pointed out i mean as scientists as well when we write press releases or the the abstract we are we're also a little bit worried that um it will get cherry picked in ways that you know climate journalism has in the past that somebody will pick up on just the uncertainties and skew it but you know, I, I think we're we're seeing more people understand climate science now. People are learning more about it and understanding uncertainties a little bit better. And you know, the shift of the six Ameri six kinds of at least in the U.S. you know concerns, alarms. You know, the the people who are totally are going to cherry pick and skew your results are becoming more and more the minority and not the people we need to be focusing on if we are kind of a little bit more upfront about the things that we don't know. I think that it helps engage people on how well exciting the science is and how much we still can do to to make differences. Um, I think we've been always yeah. of, of being misinterpreted and you know those people's minds we're probably not going to change anyway so maybe we just need to, <laughs> to accept that. Um, well, yeah, and get, getting back to the things you can do now, and that, I'm glad you mentioned that um, Jeremy's uh, work um, and his uh, uh, co-author of his, Liz Ulti. Ulti, got yeah. Into, Ulti, yeah, got into yeah. this. And uh, I wrote about that here and did a conversation with, um, with yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, did a great paper on the um, kind of some of the societal impacts and things we can do. Um, yeah, and... It, I guess my my hope for journalism is that even though it's hard, we find ways to engage folks on these big questions as well as the sort of news bites. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so okay, we know Greenland's going to be losing ice for centuries to come, if not millennia. We know that. Right. The initiation of a of a the timing of the initiation of a more dramatic rate this seems still fairly murky um we know we don't know that you know it's like known unknown unknown uh, <laughs> Andy, I think you are muted. You know what? I was going to say I can't hear, but anyway. No, you're right. So anyway, I'm no. I'm, I'm, I've got to go. I'm sorry. Yep. I thought this was going to be an hour, and it's now an hour. I'm and sorry. Hour. I know, but I, I'm sorry. But I hope I thought there was some 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 stuff there that'd be useful for you both to to uh, react to. Um, but we can uh, we can revisit. You know. Um, well, you know, we spoke about it early in the early in the session, but yeah, it's that's it's clickbait. That's all. But the story that says, you know how Greenland's melting? Well, it's still melting. I mean, you know, that's right. not not uh, not a page one plot. So, yeah, I, I, what, what I was going to say is, if there's anything we as journalists can do to pass along how we ideally think, so so the reader has some more capacity to look at a headline and just pause for two seconds before you know, i mean one of the other problems is that so many of the people writing about this now have no background in it and even we did not you know what yeah. we had was uh good contacts good sources in the science community most journalists don't have that um mm -hmm. most television uh news outlets the only person with any science background of any kind is the meteorologist and for whatever reason the meteorological community is differentially blessed with si with climate deniers. So I, you know, it, I don't know. I feel like it's pointless to blame the journalists or to look for journal to journalists for the answer because we don't have the resources as a group. Yeah. And it's not going to come. It, it has to come from the research community and their motives are not necessarily pure either. So I don't know what the answer is except that, you know, reality bites you in the ass every time. And um, that's what's starting to happen. So maybe that will make a difference. Joy Deep, if you have time for a last reflection. I, I, I completely agree with what Cornelia just said. 
that yes it 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 makes the only way to make it a story that people will read is to bring it home to your reader mm -hmm. yes. uh, what uh, uh, when, when, when if greenland's ice melts so what unless right. if i unless i cannot answer that so what question in my story nobody's going to read it so i need to answer that for my reader Very deep. that's what we call the nut graph at the time yeah absolutely yeah well i'm really well, glad sorry I, you know what? I'm really sorry, but I have yep. I got to No, go. no, no. No, thank you. It's a Friday, and there's so, so much on everyone's plate. So, Cornelia Dean, thanks so much for being here. Thank uh, you I'd for being here. I really enjoyed the conversation. It was fascinating. I, I did, too. I would love Bye to have everybody. you back again. Take care. This is Andy Bye. Revkin. You can, you can just click out. Uh, thanks again for being here and okay. come back. Well, thank you Bye. for inviting me, and I hope we'll do it again. We will. Bye-bye. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, -bye. Bye, everyone. So that was uh, J Joy Deep Gupta from the um, the great uh, online enterprise uh, third poll, which I encourage you to follow, the thethirdpoll.net, and Cornelia Dean, who was the science editor at the New York Times for a long time, especially during my tenure there, and she's the author of some great books, one on how to read, how to how to think like a scientist, and this book against the tide. Uh, if you're still watching, I'm going to click back one more time to uh, the interview I was doing. Whoops, that's the wrong one. With um, and then so what do you do with that knowledge? Part. And as you said to me, at to least to the end here, here if you're still there. Assessment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there, there's innumerable things people can do. Um, exactly. Yeah. And it's right down to your local zoning board meeting to to voting, how you vote. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, so that. It just feels hopeful that scientists like you are trying to make that connection in here too. Um, I, I think I've got Liz, uh, Liz's work here. Yeah, I think she was down in this. Yeah. So this this was my home, uh, the the town I lived in back in the Hudson Valley, um, in uh, Cold Spring on a, a tidal part of the Hudson River, and erosion, erosion. <laughs> there it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is is there. Um, and we're still doing some pretty stupid things at the local level and, and even at the federal level. So yeah, uh, and it, you know, as climate like scientists, we're learning these other. It's learned. I mean, we we've been trained in glaciology and ice dynamics and ice flow, and so um, you know, we're forging new collaborations with the people thinking about the impacts and and what what they need to know at what time frames, um, which is a really exciting kind of new avenue of research for a lot of people. Um, uh, Liz and Jeremy have, have kind of done a lot of that um, already, and I think it's been really impactful. So I hope that's a, a new direction for our field. Well, and what you just described there too is um, crossing discipline, mm -hmm. disciplinary lines. It's not just talking to the public, but having social scientists talking with uh, glaciologists Right. It feels like it's very useful. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really hard. It takes time. Uh, it's learning a new language sometimes, <laughs> literally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I recently did a session, this uh, social scientist, um, on um, what they call qualitative data. And I know that there are hard, quote unquote, hard scientists who say, what the WTF? <laughs> How can there be qualitative data? And journalists the same. Uh, Seth Bornstein, who wrote one of the good, the good story on this, uh, he had a great conversation. We had a great conversation about that. So, crossing disciplinary lines, finding ways to get from ice sheets to Main Street, as Liz put it in mm -hmm. her, uh, her paper, great title. Uh, is critical. And then for anyone scrolling, uh, you know, I do think I'm going to get back to the slides here. Well, here's this paper. Here's the paper. You know, not everyone can has the time to read the actual paper. Uh, but when you're reading a news account about a paper like this, I think in the end, there's value to um, to looking for a couple of keywords that can help you help guide you before you tweet into, uh, you know, how to think, how to think about it, how to um, how to uh, act on it yourself, how to convey it to others. Um, let me just show it one more time. So one word I think to look for is the word uh, if, yeah, right here. So, so here I have a little color code, green, good. So uh, Damien, Damien Carrington at the, at the Guardian, whose work I, I sometimes feel, you know, we're 
colleagues, but I would love to have him think about being more careful sometimes about <laughs> conclusions. Mm -hmm. But but this is really good. Yeah, billions of people live in coastal regions, making flooding due to rising sea level one of the greatest long-term impacts of the climate crisis. That is a that sentence can't be repeated enough. Right. <laughs> And then there's the if. If Greenland's record melt in the year of 2012 becomes a routine occurrence, it is possible, as it says, then the ice cap will deliver a staggering 78 centimeters of sea level, the scientists said. But the paper didn't put a time scale on that. So if is a good word. Uh, when someone is offering an educated guess, he's very, these, these are very highly educated scientists. There are, there are these expert assessments that are done these days is another way of getting around uncertainty mm -hmm. that that you know come up with best guesses of, of you know seasoned scientists but there there are issues even with um, expert elicitation so educated guess is something you do so you said uh, you know the team doesn't know how long it will take for all the doomed ice to melt but making an education educated guess he said it would probably be uh, by the end of the century or at least 2150 although he's not ruling out that it could be 2200 or 2300 you know it's like right. in the end i think some of this is like arguing about a bus that's slowly starting to roll down a hill <laughs> if you're arguing about this you know the pace of the bus you're missing the point. right <laughs> and we're all in the bus and we're all so, in the bus we don't know what it's gonna so, hit right? oh no it's one mile an hour no it's two mile an hour you know, <laughs> can, can we can we get past that and um and headlines, you know, zombie ice from Greenland will raise at sea level 10 inches. I, I added the little sticker, sure, but by when? <laughs> and let's, and that's something to talk about. And then how does that relate to our zoning and our, uh, our property values and what we do? Well, greenhouse gases is really important to dig in on. Exactly. Um, well, I'll just, you know, thank you so much for taking time out. I, I think you're on sabbatical this year. So you're taking time out of time out. <laughs> and that's, I just well, thanks for it. highlighting the. I think this is a really useful way to to look at and parse some of these articles and press releases of um, you know what to what to dig into deeper. That's a helpful approach that that others try to emulate. So, thanks All for right. looking. Well, we we'll just keep on trying. <laughs> Take um, care. Then, you too. And just here's this. Uh, I did put a sticker up out there on okay. social <laughs> sure. media. For media whiplash be careful when something feels overstated uh, and you don't want to certainly contribute to the whiplash yourself by right for, forwarding around something and just go moving on thanks again it's yep. great, great great to have you on lee take care so that's it for a long special session of our friday news review thanks for being here today uh, wherever you are um and you can share this afterwards cut it up in pieces uh, post uh, the highlights and um, I'll be writing writing about it on my dispatch revken.bulletin.com so you can always uh, subscribe to that and keep track of what we're doing here as well. I appreciate your being out there and whether you stumble up, whether you were here live or find me find it later. And let me know what you want to talk about next. Um, the scrolling bar at the bottom has the information on how to reach me. So this is Andy Revkin, the New York Times, uh, New York Times, huh? formerly the New York Times, uh, now uh, at Columbia Climate School, uh, signing off for on a crazy Friday after a long week of the uh, unfolding Anthropocene. Be well.